Hi everyone, I'm just checking if this is actually working. Um, give me just a second. Sorry about that everybody, I'm still learning the technology for how to do this properly. And also, I'm really, really sorry because I promised, well, not so much promised, but hoped that we would have um, cats here to show you. I have three cats um, and I particularly wanted Millie to be here because she is the cat who inspired The Curious Kitten, which is one of the books I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, until about 10 seconds ago, I had two cats in this room, neither of which were Millie, but I'm hoping that she might decide to make an appearance um, during the um, during the video and if you hear any jingling noises those are cat collar bells so i've now got one cat but obviously not the right cat um who's hopefully going to come and um, say hello to you at some point during this video so uh, because i haven't got the real millie i did prepare in advance um just in case <laughs> so this is what millie looks like she's a bengal cat she's very beautiful um, and I particularly love this photograph of her because it makes her look as though she's really, really gorgeously well behaved. Um, it's the way she's sitting very, very tidily with her paws neatly together and her tail um, wrapped around her paws. And it makes her look as though she would never, ever do anything silly or naughty. In fact, she is a terrible food thief um, and she's, um, she's also really, really nosy. She loves exploring things um, and she's really good at climbing into places where she shouldn't be. Um, and about, um, oh, I've got some technical adjustment going on here. Hang on a second. Uh, we can't see you. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, if you've been desperately trying to look at a picture and I've not actually been showing it to you. Thank you. <laughs> Luckily, I have... Um, technological help here from my husband John who's um, very good with cameras and things because I'm not as you might have noticed so this is Millie for those of you who've been desperately trying to see her until now um, and I was just explaining that the way I love the way she's sitting in this picture because it makes her look really um, very perfectly behaved and she's not uh, she's really good at climbing into small places and about oh oh gosh nine years ago now we had some work done on our house um we were having um an extension built partly in fact so i could have this room to write in because um until then i'd been doing most of my writing sitting on the sofa to be honest um and we i needed a space partly also because i needed somewhere to put all the books because um, every time you have a book published, you get sent copies of it, which is amazing. And then you get sent copies of it when you have um, foreign translations done. So I've actually got a room that's pretty full of books at the moment, and I needed somewhere to put them all. So part of the extension was to have a, my writing room built. And Millie thought this was fantastic, because suddenly there were all these people um, in her house, all the builders, electricians, plumbers, um, and everyone made a fuss of her, and she really, really loved it. Um, until she managed to have what could have been a pretty scary adventure, because we very nearly lost her, in fact. Um, so I put that story into The Curious Kitten, which is this book. Hang on a minute. The Curious Kitten. Um, and in The Curious Kitten... The cat is actually called Cleo. That's only because I'd used the name Millie in a previous book that Millie had inspired for me. Um, she is an extremely useful cat for a writer. She's very good at getting into trouble, getting into adventures. Um, and so this is actually Millie's second book, so I couldn't call the cat in this one Millie. And you'll notice that um, Cleo on the cover doesn't actually look like Millie either. So um, in this story, Cleo is a bit like Millie. She's really, really nosy. And the house um, opposite her, across the road, is having building work done. And Cleo thinks this is the most exciting thing ever. And I put Millie's real adventure into this book, but I changed it around a bit to make it a bit more exciting at the end. So see if you can work out um, what happens and 
what I what actually happened with Millie and what I changed to make the story a bit more adventurous. Right, so Millie's owner is called Amber um, and she loves Millie, I'm sorry, Cleo even, she really loves Cleo but she is a bit worried because she's just gone back to school after the summer holidays. They got Cleo at the beginning of the summer holidays and Cleo's used to having them around all the time and now um, Amber's really worried that Cleo is going to be missing her while she's at school. How's Cleo? Amber's friend Maisie asked in class a couple of days later, spotting the photo that Amber had stuck onto the front of her planner. Has she learned any more tricks? Amber had told her all about the games she'd invented with Cleo. Amber rolled her eyes. Yes, she's learned how to scramble onto the back wall, then climb all the way over the garage roof so she can get into the front garden. Leela leaned over the table. Why? What's so exciting about your front garden? Who knows? Amber sighed. But it's got a road in front of it. That's the problem. There's this really nice lady who lives down our street, Susan. Her cat got run over last year. He crawled back in through the cat flap with a broken leg. He had to have an operation to fix the bone back together with metal pins. Then he had to live in a cat crate for two months to stop him walking on it. But that's not going to happen to Cleo, Leela said comfortingly. It might do. Amber ran her finger over Cleo's whiskers in the photo. They were so white and they fanned out like she had a moustache. She's only little and she doesn't know what cars are. The people across the road are starting to have an extension built this week, Mum was telling me. She was saying it might be tricky to get out of our driveway because of all the builders' vans and things. So that's loads more traffic to worry about. I'm sure it'll be okay, put in a quiet voice. Amber looked over at the other side of the table, a bit surprised. The two classes in the year had been mixed around again and she didn't know George very well. He'd always been in the other class in her year. She'd not seen him on her way to school either, so she guessed he didn't live very close by. They'd been on the same table for a week now, but George hadn't said much at all. My mum's cat, Pirate, goes up and down our street, and he does cross the road sometimes, but he's really careful. I bet your kitten will just learn what to do. George is right, Leela agreed. Cats are clever. I'm sure Cleo will learn how to cross the road, no problem. Maybe, Amber said. She loved how Cleo was so curious. It made her even more fun to play with. But it also meant that she liked to explore everything. She sighed to herself as Mr Evans told them to stop chatting and settle down. She was probably worrying too much. It was the first time they'd had a pet, after all. She just couldn't help that little nagging feeling that Cleo was too nosy for her own good. Cleo sat perched on the front wall peering out from under a climbing rose and eyeing the men working on the other side of the road. There was one big truck with a crane lifting off huge pallets of bricks. Then there were two smaller vans and lots of people going backwards and forwards between them and the house. She wanted to get closer to see what was going on. The road was in between her and the action though and she didn't like the way the cars roared and growled as they shot past. Yesterday, after a few days of exploring the front garden, She'd actually ventured out onto the pavement. First, she just stood by the gate, flinching back when a car came past. But they all seemed to stick to the road, and she was sure the pavement looked safe enough. She'd crept along the bottom of the wall, keeping well away from the road. Then, a car sped by. Cleo had felt the rumbling of the road under her paws and smelled the exhaust, and she'd raced back to the safety of the garden. She still wasn't quite brave enough to cross the road and investigate the unusual things that were happening on the other side. Cleo edged between two bushes as another van came driving up, but this time, when the van stopped, it was on her side of the road. Cleo wriggled out between the thick stems, her whiskers twitching. The driver was getting out. Cleo could see his heavy boots walking round the side of the van. Then he opened up the back doors and lifted out a box which he carried across the road to the interesting house on the other side. Almost without realising it, Cleo started padding eagerly out into the middle of the pavement. The van was new and exciting, and she wanted to see what was in it. Then the man started coming back. Cleo ducked under the sprawling fuchsia bush in the garden next door. Amber and Sarah always tried to grab her when she went out at the front of the house. 
She didn't want this man to catch her now and stop her exploring. But the man didn't even notice her. He just unloaded another box and set off across the road again, leaving the van's back doors open. As Cleo edged out of the bush, she came to a sudden halt. Her collar was caught on the wiry branches. She pulled at it crossly. She hated collars. When the safety catch came open, she tossed her head briskly from side to side, enjoying the freedom. Then she hurried out from under the bush, shaking the dry leaves from her fur. Cleo sniffed at the tyres of the van and then stretched up, putting her front paws on the little back step. The van was full of boxes, some old sacks, a folded plastic sheet and all sorts of fascinating things. There were dark corners and good smells to investigate too. She jumped up, scrabbling to get her back legs onto the step, and clambered into the van. It was dusty, which made her sneeze, but that didn't put her off. She prowled further inside and rubbed up against one of the boxes. She liked this place, and she wanted to mark it as hers. Suddenly there was a shout from outside and the sound of footsteps approaching. Cleo froze, laying her ears back. What was happening? Was someone coming to chase her out? She backed between the box and a pile of sacks and watched round-eyed as the doors at the back of the van swung shut with a slam. She was trapped. Now, that is almost exactly what happened to Millie, except that I did decide to make it a bit more exciting. What really happened was that, um, exactly as I put it in the story, Millie went out exploring the van and she climbed right inside. But luckily, just before our builder shut the doors on her, um, he happened to look inside the van and he saw that she was there looking back at him. So he, um, he picked her up underneath her front paws and grabbed her um, and marched back into the house and sort of held her out at me saying, I've just got your cat out of my van. And I was really, really panicked because I knew um, that our builder didn't live anywhere close to us at all. He lived in the next town. So if Millie had um, driven, been driven off in his van um, and then op he'd opened the doors again and she'd come out um, all by herself, she would have had no idea where she was. So I was really, really worried about her. But after I'd finished worrying about her and panicking a bit and um, uh, thinking what might have happened, I went away and I wrote down um, in a notebook what might have happened because I knew that she'd actually, actually just given me a really, really good plot for a book. And in fact, um, there are several bits in that, in that part of the story that I just read to you that were inspired by Millie. So um, I mentioned that she, um, she really doesn't like, that Cleo in this story really doesn't like collars, which is exactly um, like Millie. I've got three cats and my two younger cats both wear collars. Millie won't have one on. She deliberately takes them off. She goes and rubs herself up against the furniture until the collar comes. Yes. Okay. I will just check. Hello, everyone. If you're waiting, sorry about this. We're getting there. <laughs> Least technologically able author ever. We're back on, but we can't see you again. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix that. Right. Right, we just need a cat to appear and knock the camera over and then we might have hit the record for most things that could possibly go wrong in one live YouTube video. I'm really sorry, everybody. So, um, I think when the video stopped, I was just in the middle of explaining that Millie hates collars, just like Cleo in this book. Um, she refuses to wear one, actually. My other two cats, uh, Poppy and Star, the younger ones, both have collars on, which is great, actually, because Poppy and Star um, are sisters from the same letter and they are very nearly identical. So having different colour coloured collars on actually really helps for rem working out which one's which. Um, but uh, Millie absolutely won't wear a collar. She rubs up against chairs um, until collars come off if you try and put them on her. The other thing um, in this story that was inspired by Millie is the cat from down um, Amber's Road who... Um, is hit by a car. Now this did actually um, happen to Millie a few years ago. Uh, it was when uh, we didn't have Poppy and Star back then, we had our previous cat Marble and we had Millie as well. 
um, one evening Millie came through the cat flap and uh, when she tried to jump up on the sofa next to us we noticed that she wasn't walking on one of her legs so we had to take her to the emergency vet and the vet reckoned she probably she'd either had a really bad fall or she'd been hit by a car and Millie jumps amazingly so I, I, I suspect she probably was hit by a car and she was she'd managed to break her back leg in what's called a spiral fracture and it really did have to be pinned back together with metal pins and then she had to live in a little cat cage um, for two months while it healed up because um, when you're when a leg's been pinned back together you aren't allowed to walk on it it's very very hard to stop a cat walking so that's why she had to be in a cage um, and she wasn't really supposed to come out of the cage at all but I have to admit I did used to sneak her out occasionally and I would bring her um, in here to sit next to me on on the chair um, while I was working because I was really worried about her okay so um, having um, talked to you about the curious kitten and read a little bit of that I thought I would talk to you about a dog book so um, this this is the story puppy which is actually my latest animal story um, and I really really love this one particularly because it was actually published last month in March on World Book Day and it felt really lovely to have a book published on World Book Day and the other thing I love about this book is that the two main characters who are Jack um, and this dog Daisy um, just find each other at exactly the right time um, Jack is really struggling at school because he's finding it really hard to get as good at reading as other people in his class. And he's starting to, it's starting to make him really frustrated and quite angry sometimes. And he started uh, messing around in school because he feels really upset about it. Um, so he's, he's really needing some support and a friend. And Daisy um, is in the animal shelter where Jack's sister Matty works. She's actually been um, abandoned. She's been um, pushed out of a car on, by the side of a road and she's so devastated and confused by what's happened um, that she is refusing to interact with anybody at the shelter she just hides under her bed for most of the time now this book was inspired by an amazing um, scheme that started to be run in an animal shelter in America um, it's actually spread um, to this country now as well but this is a photograph that I saw um, actually on Facebook um, a couple of years ago that made me, um, well, it actually, it made, it made me want to cry because it's just so lovely. This is um, a, sm a girl reading to a dog at an animal shelter in the United States. Um, and the point, the reason for doing this is to get the dogs used to seeing as many different people as possible. So obviously when you adopt a dog from a shelter, you want to be able to take them home and have them be friendly. So the more people the dogs see, um, the happier and um, better with people it will make them. And obviously it just stops them being bored if there's somebody around talking to them. Um, and actually dogs love being read to just as much as people do. Um, they love the sense of a, a really kind of calm, soothing voice reading to them. And it's really good as well if dogs get used to children because obviously there are lots of families out there who might want to adopt a dog. So if a dog is um, is good with children, it's more likely to be adopted. But the thing is, it's actually good for the children doing the reading too because sometimes when you're reading out loud to somebody, it can feel like they're being a bit of a critical audience. But a dog just listens and that's really, really lovely. So I love this photograph. Um, and also I've got another photo because um, this is done with cats too. Now, I particularly love this photo because it actually looks so the cat is um, is enjoying the book just as much as the boy is. So, um, the story puppy was inspired by seeing these pictures of children in animal shelters reading to the animals. Now, I'm just going to read you um, a chapter of the story puppy and you'll find out a little bit more about Jack and about Daisy and about how they start to be able to help each other. Jack had only seen Daisy for a couple of minutes, but he couldn't stop thinking about her. She was tiny and white all over, with soft ears and a stubby, scruffy little tail. Matty said that breakfast and dinner were the only times they really saw her, two minutes of desperate gobbling before she scurried back to hide under her bed. 
Lucy and Adrian have both spent as much time with her as they can, she'd explained to Jack. Adrian was the other full-time member of staff at the shelter. Lucy goes in and just sits in the pen for ages. She's hoping that Daisy will get used to her being there and come out, but she hasn't so far. The thing is, they're so busy. The shelter's full again. Any time they spend coaxing Daisy to be friendly, it's time they have to take away from the other dogs and cats. It didn't seem fair to Jack that Daisy needed help and everyone was too busy to give it to her. He wished he could help, but he wasn't old enough to be an unofficial volunteer at the shelter. He didn't know anything about helping a dog like Daisy either. He'd probably get it all wrong, but he definitely wanted to see her again, even if all he saw was a little hump under her bed. So the next day, instead of going home with Amara and her mum and Anika, he persuaded Massey to come and pick him up. He told Amara why on the school on the way to school that morning. He didn't want her to think he was abandoning her. Once he told her about Daisy, though, she was all for it. Can you take a picture of her? she asked. Massey could take one on her phone, couldn't she? Maybe while she's eating, Jack said. Otherwise it'll be a photo of a dog bed. Oh, that's so sad. I wish I could come with you. I want to go to the shelter anyway. Maybe we could persuade my mum and dad to get a cat. I could ask Matty to take you with us one day, Jack suggested. Amara nodded. Then she looked at Jack, chewing her lip as though she wasn't sure what to say. Did you finish that book? Almost, Jack muttered. Mr Gardner had checked on their reading diaries the day before, and he'd done his I'm very disappointed face when he realised that Jack was still in the middle of the book about the golden retriever. Mr Gardner said to do it last night. Yeah, but I was at the shelter with Matty, Jack shrugged. I bet he didn't think I would anyway. He knows I'm useless at reading. Amara eyed him doubtfully. He sounded like he meant it to me. I hope you don't get told off again. Jack looked worried for a moment, and then he grinned at Amara. I won't. We've got that history day, remember? There are people coming in to do a workshop. I'll finish the reading tonight, no problem. You'd better, Amara said seriously. I like our table the way it is. If you keep getting in trouble, we'll all be moved round again. And I'll end up sitting next to Lola or somebody else mean. All right, I will, I promise, Jack sighed. You're worse than Mr Gardner. Do you want help with getting the food ready again, Matty suggested. Definitely, Jack nodded. The more he did to help out, the more time Matty and the others would have to spend with the animals. It was called socialising. Jack hadn't really got it when Matty had explained it to him before, but now he saw how much love and attention Daisy needed. He measured out the food for Matty while she ferried the bowls to the pens. They'd finished getting all the dog's dinners ready when Matty suddenly stopped frowning at him. Hang on, I've just remembered. Haven't you got homework to do? Amara said I had to make sure you finished your book. I can do it later, Jack protested. Uh-uh, we'll get home. You'll have dinner, you'll be really tired, you won't have time to finish it. Just go and sit in the visitor's room now. Jack glared at her, but then he gave a massive huffy sigh and went to get his backpack. Matty was right, though, and so was Amara. He didn't want Mr Gardner moving them round in class either. He was searching through his backpack for the reading book when it struck him. He had to do the reading, but it didn't matter where he did it. Matty had said that Lucy went and sat in Daisy's pen to try and get her used to people. He couldn't do that. Lucy would definitely say no in case Daisy got really scared and nipped him. But he could sit just outside her pen, couldn't he? That would be almost as good. He could sit still and not scare her. And even though he had to sound out a lot of the words, he could do it quietly. Jack hurried down the passage to the pen at the end and sat down, leaning against the wall. The floor was a bit hard, but it wasn't too bad. Besides, Daisy was lying on the hard floor all day. Hey, Daisy, he whispered. He could just about see the end of her tail sticking out from under the dog bed. Are you okay? I've got to finish this reading homework, so I thought I'd do it with you. He looked at the bump under the bed for a moment, almost as though he thought she might answer him. Then he shook his head and opened up the book, flicking through the pages to the right place. He was a long way from the end. OK, so, page 46. Benny pushed the gate shut with his nose. Jack read on, slowly sounding out the hardest words. 
He wasn't sure if Mr. Gardiner would think reading to a dog counted as reading with an adult, especially since Daisy was only a puppy and she wasn't actually listening. But Jack liked it more than reading to Mum or Matty. He knew Daisy was there, so it still felt like he was reading to someone, but she didn't mind if he got the words wrong or took ages to work them out. Matty fidgeted when he read to her. He was pretty sure she didn't know she was doing it, but she always fiddled with the hem of her sweater or jiggled her feet around like she was bored. Mum sat still, but she tried to help too much. She was always telling him not to worry. When he wasn't, she was the one who was worrying. He got to the end of the page and stopped for a rest, stretching out his shoulders. He'd been hunching forward, peering at the book. Then he froze. There had been a flash of white inside the pen. He was sure of it. Her daisy moved. There was no sign of her now, except for that little wisp of white tail sticking out. Slowly, Jack started to read again. He kept his face down towards the book, but every so often he rolled his eyes sideways to look into the pen. He was about halfway down the next page, and how had that happened? It felt like the fastest he'd ever managed to read anything, when a black nose appeared from under the dog bed, and the stub of tail disappeared. Daisy was wriggling forward. She was listening. Jack went on. He wasn't sure he'd be able to tell Mr. Gardner what happened on any of those pages. He was too busy keeping an eye on Daisy. But he was reading. And he liked that he was reading about a dog to a dog. After a few more sentences, the rest of Daisy's muzzle edged out from under the bed, and he could just see her dark eyes glinting at him from under the fabric. Oh, he murmured a couple of minutes later. Only one more chapter to go. Do you like this story? He peered at Daisy again and went on talking quietly. There was more of her sticking out now. He could see her collar and her front paws were showing too, one on each side. Jack flicked the pages over. The last chapter was short, only a couple of pages. He could do that, definitely. By the time he'd got to the very end of the book, Daisy was still lying on the floor, but only half of her was under her bed. She lay watching Jack with her nose on her crossed front paws, and she really seemed to be listening, as if she was actually enjoying listening to him read. Jack couldn't remember the last time that that had happened. So I loved writing that book, because it really felt as though Jack and Daisy both needed each other at the same time. Um, and as I said, it was just really special having a book published on World Book Day as well. So, um, I asked on Twitter and Facebook if anyone had any questions that they wanted answered. And I wasn't sure how many I would get, but you have been fabulous and sent in so many brilliant questions. I'm just going to find my list now. So, um, we'll start off with Sam, who's seven, from Basingstoke. And Sam would like to know whether I prefer kittens or puppies. Well, that is really difficult because I've owned both dogs and cats in the past. Um, and I love both. I had um, two gorgeous dogs when I was growing up, um, a Dachshund called Max and an English Bull Terrier called Alice. Um, but at the moment, um, I only have cats and I think my cats would probably uh, be very annoyed if I said I preferred dogs. So I have to say that at the moment I prefer cats. And also, um, Sam's mum asked a question too. Um, she would like to know if I'm going to write any more books um, like The Story Puppy um, that have a boy as the main character. And the answer to that is yes, I think I probably will. Most of the animal stories have girl main characters, although there are quite a lot of boys who are who are in the books as well. Um, but I think I've mostly written girl main characters because I, when I'm writing, I'm often looking back on the feelings and the and the um, the adventures and things that happened to me when I was growing up. So it's easier to write about them from a girl's point of view. But actually, I really enjoyed um, the difference of writing about. Um, Jack in the story puppy. So yes, probably is the answer to that one. Um, and then Ophelia, who's 10, would like to know what my pets are called and how many I have. Well, at this point, I was really hoping to show you some cats, um, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So um, you've seen the picture of Millie already. Um, this is Millie's um, half sister, who's called Poppy. Um, this is a photo of her when she was a kitten. Um, I love this picture because she's in, she's in mid-meow. 
Poppy is incredibly bossy. She wakes um, me up at six o'clock every morning because she wants to be fed um, and she sees no reason why she should have to wait to be fed. Um, so this is Poppy um, and this is Star. Now, funnily enough, Star has actually just walked into the room, but I'm not sure she's actually going to cooperate and come anywhere near the camera. Does he? Come here. Come on. Yeah, she's letting me stroke her, but I don't think she's going to jump up onto the armchair. And I don't want to grab her because she'd probably uh, manage to um, knock the camera over because she's she's um, she's quite clever like that. She's very good at bumping into things. Anyway, this is a picture of Star. And when she is in a good mood, she likes to sleep um, next to me when I'm writing. So this is my laptop. and This is the chair that I'm sitting in now, you can see. And this is Star. Um, she likes to lie in the space between me and the chair. This photo was actually taken when she was a bit smaller. She's quite big now. Um, and so there's not as much room for her. And she likes to lie on the laptop instead, which is not particularly helpful. Um, and that is actually the answer to Evangeline, Ophelia's sister's question. Evangeline's eight, and she wanted to know what the funniest thing that's happened with my pets while I've been writing is. And I would say it's probably Star deciding to lie on the computer instead and adding loads of words to books. The words are never particularly useful words. They're always just a random mash of letters. She's also very good at turning on the caps lock key so that when I then try and get into the computer the next time, the password doesn't work because she's put the caps lock on instead. Um, so those are my cats. And then Esme would like to know how long it takes me to write a book because I've written so many. So Esme's right, actually. I have written, I'm just trying to remember now, it's, I think at the moment, 139 books which is quite scary, but that is over the last 17 years. Um, it usually, to write a book um, like The Curious Kitten or The Story Puppy, it usually takes me about a month to write the first draft. Um, the first draft is like the, the very first version. But before I start writing, I plan my books out quite carefully. I work out what I think is going to happen in each chapter. And then as I'm writing, quite often it changes, um, and that's good because it means that the characters are starting to um, take the story over, which makes it much more exciting for me writing it and then for you reading it later on as well. Um, but what I usually do is I update my plan as I'm going. So if something changes, I change what I've put down for the plan in the rest of the chapters. And it's a bit like having a map to follow for the story. So I know where I'm going. and It means I've, I know what I've got to fit into each chapter. so The next chapter will work properly. So... Um, I plan this out, then I write the first draft, and then I send it to my editor, um, and she will tell me all the things that are wrong with it, a bit like you having your homework marked, um, and she'll make suggestions for how to make it better. So I usually do that process about three or four times, so I'll write several different drafts. I don't start all over again from the beginning each time, but I'll, I might change quite big portions of the book, um, perhaps because there's... Um, there's a character who's not got enough um, going going on with their story, or um, or one of my editors has noticed that there's a what's called a plot hole where something goes wrong, so it doesn't really hang together properly. So um, it usually takes between me starting to plan the book out and there being a final finished book with the um, amazing illustrations by Sophie Williams as well. Um, it usually takes about a year. So thank you for that one, Esme. And then Lucy, who's eight, and she's from Reading, which is actually where I live. So hello, Lucy. Um, she would like to know, um, do I also, she also wanted to know how long it takes to write a book. So I've partly answered that question. But Lucy's other question was, do I use the same illustrator for all my books? Well, yes, for all of these books, the animal stories, um, Sophie, who I just mentioned, has done the pictures. She's done all the covers and she's done almost all the amazing um, inside illustrations as well. Um, she's very, very good at drawing beautiful cats and dogs. Um, except there was, I think, one book where um, Sophie was really, really busy and couldn't do it. So we had a different illustrator for that one. But I have different illustrators for my different series. So um, I've got a new series coming out called Museum Kittens, which, hang on a minute, here it is. Um, so this is the first book in the Museum Kittens series and the illustrator for these books is called Sarah Lodge and I love these um, illustrations too. They're very different to Sophie's um, but they are very, they're very different looking sorts of cats but I just, I think they're beautiful. This is one of my absolute favourite pictures. Um, this is a very um, sad, shy kitten um, called Peter who's currently um, feeling a little bit friendless and I, I adore that picture of him with his 
with his big sad eyes. So, um, Loralee, who's seven and from Dorridge, would like to know, did I meet any tigers when I went to Russia? So, I think Loralee might have watched one of my other YouTube videos, which is about my book, Star. Um, and Star is about a Siberian tiger. And I was really, really lucky in December last year. I got to go to Siberia um, to be part of the book launch for um, Star in the Russian translation. Um, and I really wish, Lorelei, that I had actually um, met real tigers. Unfortunately not. They are incredibly rare. There are only about 400 Siberian tigers left in the wild. Um, so, no, I didn't see one, but I really wish I had because they do look so beautiful and they are just um, so incredibly rare. What I did see, though, was one of these. Now, I'm afraid it still wasn't in the wild. It was in an aquarium. But this is what's called a Baikal seal. Now, they look quite like normal seals, except they look a bit like they've been blown up like a balloon. They are so um, round and squishy and plump. They are really, really gorgeous. Um, and we watched one of these swimming um, round and round, and it kept coming up to the glass and looking at us as well, actually. And they have got very funny little faces that are sort of in the middle of this big balloon-shaped seal. They're really gorgeous. Um, so Lake Baikal is a, a lake in Siberia um, that is the deepest um, inland freshwater lake in the world. Um, it's actually a kilometre and a half deep in the middle. It's incredible. If you look at a sort of cut through of, um, of the landscape there, it goes along, along, along and then down massively like this. Um, and the amazing thing about Lake Baikal is that in the winter it freezes over and you can go skating on it, even though it's so deep. It doesn't freeze solid, um, but it freezes down to quite a, a thick depth. So it's safe to skate, to skate on and to walk on. Um, and also the ice freezes very, very clear. So you can look down and see, see plants in the ice. And it's, it's really beautiful. It wasn't actually frozen when I went there in December, but um, I'm sort of glad about that because um, when I went there, it was minus 10 degrees and it can actually get down to minus 30, apparently, um, when it's really, really cold there. So I'm not sure I would have liked that. Um, and I've got another question from T, who's seven as well. Um, and she's also asking about Star because her favourite books are Star and A Kitten Called Tiger. Um, and... That's because she really, really loves tigers. And she wants to know where I got the ideas for my animal stories from. So A Kitten Called Tiger, um, the idea actually came directly from Poppy, who is also a very useful writer's cat. Um, she, um, the main part of the story in A Kitten Called Tiger um, is that Tiger manages to get himself stuck in next door's garden. Um, and Tiger's owner has to rescue him by climbing over a wall. Well, that is exactly what happened. Poppy managed to get herself stuck in Next Door's garden. Now, Next Door have got two dogs who are absolutely lovely dogs. They're really beautiful, really friendly. But any dog is going to get a bit um, upset when a cat suddenly appears in its garden. So they did do a lot of barking. And I was really, really worried about Poppy because um, our Next Door neighbours were out at work at the time. So I couldn't get them to come and let her out. So I had to climb over next door's garden wall, uh, which involved ladders and me falling off a ladder. And Poppy was absolutely fine, but I did manage to scratch all down the sides of my arms. So um, that's the answer to that question. That is exactly where that story came from. And lots of my stories are inspired by my animals. I haven't actually owned every single animal that is in all of my books because that would just be too many. But almost all of my stories have got something in them that um, is something that really happened to either one of my animals or sometimes um, an animal that belonged to a friend or that I've read about in a news story. They're all inspired by real animals somewhere. Um, so the story puppy, for example, was inspired by seeing those, um, those lovely photographs of the animal shelters in the States where the children were reading to the dogs and the cats. And then Ed, who's also seven, would like to know what my favourite wild animal is. Well, at the moment, um, because I've just written Star, which is a tiger book, I love tigers. I spent so much time finding out about different tigers um, and uh, reading up about their habits. And and this is the really great thing about getting about writing wild animal books that you get to find out so many um, brilliant things that you didn't know before. Um, a few years ago, I, I wrote a book um, called The Snow Bear about polar bears. And I discovered then that um, 
Polar bears don't have white fur. Their fur is actually transparent and it's also hollow. So if you ever go and see um, a polar bear in a zoo and its fur has got a bit of a greenish tinge, that is because um, the algae from their swimming, swimming pools um, gets inside their fur and turns their fur green. So if you ever see a greenish polar bear, it's because it's got algae living inside its fur. And that's the kind of um, strange fact that, that you only find out when you do when you do research into a particular animal. And I really, really enjoy doing that. Hazel, who is nine, would like to know, um, do I do my writing on paper or do I do it on a computer? Well, bit of both, to be honest. Um, I do use notebooks quite a lot, mostly for writing ideas down in, a bit like I wrote down the idea for the Curious Kitten after Millie had had her adventure with that builder's van. Um, and I tend to use notebooks mostly for writing ideas, but then I do most of the actual writing of the book on a laptop. And in fact, my very first book, I wrote almost the whole book in a notebook because I wrote it um, when I was still working in London um, for a publisher and I used to write uh, when I was commuting on the train and I wrote um, the whole book in a big notebook and then I typed it up afterwards and I actually used the money that the publishers paid me for that first book to buy a laptop with um, because until then I didn't have one and it was really it was a little tiny laptop that I could take on the train quite easily. Then Naomi who's 10 wants to know who was my favourite author as a child so I really, really loved a series of books um, by C.S. Lewis, the Narnia stories. Um, the most famous one is called The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. That was the first one he wrote. My favourite is actually called The Horse and His Boy, which, because it's got the most amazing um, bossy horse character in. And the best bit about the Narnia books is that all the animals talk. And I know that reading those books over and over again has had a huge effect on the stories that I write now. Um, and uh i really do thank c.s lewis an awful lot because um i know he's been a lot of the inspiration behind me wanting to write and and the kind of books i write now and then the last question was from lucy who says that she really likes the magic molly books and she particularly likes one called um the shy piglet and she wanted to, wanted to know if i'd ever actually owned a piglet and i like pigs or even um, did i even actually grow up on a farm Unfortunately, Lucy, the answer to all those questions is, um, well, not all of them. I do like pigs, but no, I've never actually owned my own piglet and I didn't grow up on a farm. Um, I grew up with a lot of animals. Um, so two dogs, a cat, uh, about 14 gerbils, I think, stick insects, fish, uh, hamsters and a mouse called Truffle. Not all at the same time. Uh, but I've never actually owned a pig, but apparently pigs are really, really clever um, and they make do actually make quite good pets, although obviously very large if you actually get a, a fully grown pig living in your house with you. Um, I would have loved to have grown up on a farm, but I did get to go and visit them occasionally. But um, I, at the moment, I just have three cats, no pigs, unfortunately. So thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I'm really sorry about all the technical details. And I'm sorry that no cats turned up as well. I feel like I've let everybody down a bit here. I have to try and um, bribe them for next time. Um, but hopefully there will be more videos. And I'm going to try and uh, read a whole book out to you chapter by chapter. I've started off reading the first few chapters of Star. And I'm going to carry on reading it chapter by chapter. So keep an eye out for more chapters of Star coming to you soon. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, and do ask more questions over on Twitter and I can try and do another video answering any more questions as well. Thanks, everybody. Bye.